we're going to bring this home to Wyoming again, and we're going to talk about mule deer. Thank you very much. Um, the endemic uh, chronic wastings disease and mule deer populations decline in Wyoming, so it's a bit of a real-world assessment. But uh, Dr. Malia DeVivo is going to speak to us. She lives here in Jackson, received her bachelor's and master's from Indiana University in Pennsylvania, and studied uh, elk, parturient elk and survival of elk calves in north-central Pennsylvania, where the real, the real elk live, the big populations. Um, and Malia received her PhD here from the, the real University of UW, University of Wyoming, uh, in veterinary science. She studied the population effects of chronic wasting disease on free-ranging mule deer in southeast Wyoming. Uh, so she's focused on cervid ecology, demography, and disease in her career. Uh, Dr. DeVizo is currently working on uh, the publications that are being generated by her CWD work and also collaborating with a local research group uh, on a project for the Jackson Hole Conservation Alliance identifying conservation targets in the Jackson Hole region. So, Malia, there she is. I hope you'll welcome her. Is that everything you need? Pointer? Okay. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, thank you. Um, for that introduction, and thank you all for returning from lunch. Um, I noticed in the program it says I'm with the Jackson Hole Conservation Alliance. I actually don't work for them. I'm collaborating with them on a project, um, but I did actually work for Teton County Weed and Pest, so <laughs> another weed and pest person. <laughs> um, so uh, I did change the title of my talk a little bit because uh, I'm not only going to talk about the population decline, but also some genetic selection uh, data that we collected in this uh, research project. Um, so I made this slide obviously prior to talking to many of you here at, the, at, at this forum, and I thought maybe I would have to make a case of why we're talking about mule deer. Um, I just had to assume that many of you were more interested in elk, um, especially because we have, uh, we're surrounded by feed grounds, and so I thought many of you, I would have to make a case about why we're talking about mule deer. So I'm still going to try to make that case, but mule deer are one of the five uh, naturally susceptible species to CWD. Um, they're declining throughout their species range. Um, and actually, here in the Jackson Hole region, um, it, we provide a lot of summer range for many disparate herds um, throughout Wyoming. Uh, and then, obviously, uh, mule deer provide tourism and hunting opportunities. So today, the outline of my talk, I'm going to give an example of what this disease potentially can do in a free-ranging uh, population. So we're going to talk about the South Converse County mule deer herd. Um, I'm going to highlight just three um, research questions. We asked a lot more questions in this, uh, this particular pro project, but for the sake of time, I'll only go over three of those uh, really big questions. Um, our methods, results, and conclusions and discussion. <coughs> So to orient ourselves to where we're talking about in the state of Wyoming, um, so we're talking about Southern Converse County. Uh, this uh, yellow dashed line is the outermost extent of where we found marked mule deer in our study. Um, and for those who don't know, and unfortunately I don't have the road, but I-25 runs through Douglas and Glenrock. And as you can see, all these deer remain south of that I-25 interstate. Um, those two red dots are where we captured mule deer for this study. So um, many of these mule deer winter within the La Perel Valley, and then many of them travel south and east to the Laramie Mountains. Um, we just had a handful that actually went directly west, uh, south of Glenrock. So the real impetus of the study um, was after uh, so all this data I'm show, showing is data collected by the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. And the real impetus of the study was that uh, whenever they were looking at their um, estimate of their, the population, uh, so they do counts post-harvest, they found that during the 2000s, this solid black line, a, trend, uh, a precipitous uh, decrease in the population. So 
In 2001, they estimated about 14,000 individuals for that particular herd, and then by 2009, um, a little less than 8,000. So this population effectively had been um, pretty much cut in half in that short amount of time. But what was interesting was that during the same time period, uh, they were collecting CWD, uh, CWD samples from hunter harvested animals, and they saw this increase in CWD prevalence. So less than 20% in 2001 to greater than 40% in 2009. So um, this really started the question, how much does CWD affect uh, the, the population in this particular herd? And so I'm just gonna give a little bit more background about this particular herd. So I stole these images directly from Game and Fish's uh, uh, job completion report that was published in 2010, but um, what they saw was while they still had um, high uh, buck ratio, so represented as these darker gray bars for this herd, they, they uh, saw lower fawn ratios for this particular herd, especially during 2008 and 2009. So only 46 and 44 fawns per 100 does. So in response to this population decline, as well as poor fawn recruitment, um, the hunting season was shortened, um, not only in duration, but uh, or decreased, um, not only in duration, but also in the number of licenses that were issued. So in 2009, there was only a one week hunting season in October. Um, they still have a general license for antlered mule deer, and they had a limited quota of 25 does or fawns uh, on private lands. So the way this looked, um, uh, we see a, a reduction in total number of animals harvested in 2009 as compared to the previous years. And if you look at uh, the, uh, the light gray bars and the almost non-existent bars, that rep represents does and fawns. And you can see not too many does and fawns were ever harvested from this population, but a major decrease in 2009. And the last thing I'll talk about is that uh, Game and Fish also established three uh, habitat transects for this herd unit. And so they measured true mountain mahogany leader growth. And they found that it, throughout the 2000s, they had uh, poor production and plant senescence, likely uh, due to fire suppression and prolonged drought. And they also saw decreased utilization of those true mountain mahogany sands. Um, and they attributed that to the decreasing population. So um, based on all that information, so the, the population trending um, downward and increased CWD prevalence, low fawn recruitment, uh, and then the limited hunting opportunities and the poor winter range habitat, this led to our study where um, in collaboration with USGS and the University of Wyoming, um, uh, we looked at the ecology and epidemiology of chronic wasting disease and how this affects this particular mule deer herd. So uh, we, could we can break down this research project into three main components. Uh, we looked at the demography and population impacts of the disease, as well as genetic susceptibility, and there was also an ecology and behavior component, but um, today I'll only be talking about the two um, components, demography and population impacts, and genetic susceptibility. So one of the first research questions that we had was, does CWD suppress vital rates? So um, today I'll talk about reproduction and recruitment and survival. And then does the prion genotype affect CWD susceptibility? And what is the population impact of CWD? So we performed a longitudinal cohort study, and this was done from 2010 to 2014, where we um, performed annual captures of adult mule deer. Um, we captured both females and males, um, but this study was started as a female-only study, but we got some, um, uh, some supplemental funding as well as uh, some collars to put on, on males, so we decided to capture just a very limited number of males just to get some baseline information 
from that sex. But this was a female-driven study. So as you can see, we used helicopter net gun technique. Um, we placed GPS radio collars on these animals, and as well as took as, uh, various biological samples. And blood was used for both pregnancy and genotyping. Uh, to determine their CWD status, we performed tonsil biopsies. And all these deer are anesthetized um, when we're handling them. Uh, we used immunohistochemistry uh, to test our, our tonsil tissue. And this is an example of a positive um, tonsil sample with the bright pink as your abnormal prion showing up. Um, we also retested CWD negative animals uh, each year just to update their CWD status. We, if an animal happened to survive to the next capture year that was already uh, test positive, uh, we did not perform the biopsy again. So we monitored animals at least twice weekly, and this was so that we could collect mortalities and perform necropsies to determine cause of death. And we performed fawn counts in November to align with when Wyoming Game and Fish was also conducting their demographic counts. All right, so uh, in total, we captured 143 deer. And again, most of those were females. So uh, we had 118 females and 25 males. Uh, the mean capture age uh, was three and a half years old. And um, I just like to throw this in because it's pretty interesting. We only actually had six deer that we initially captured in 2010 that we were able to release without collars in 2014. So only six deer um, that were enrolled initially in the study survived to the end. Uh, so um, two CWD metrics that most people talk about are prevalence and incidence. And as you can see, um, so males are on the left side of, of the bar, of the, are the left side of this um, chart. And you can see that for, for both prevalence and incidence, um, males have much higher prevalence as well as incidence for this population. And I, I believe Dr. Wood um, pointed this out that this, was, this is pretty common what we see in most free ranging populations with higher prevalence in males. Um, and this is just another look at prevalence. So um, each capture year, uh, it's broken down by each capture year. So CWD prevalence, again, was uh, significantly lower in females for um, all four years of the study compared to males. And as you can see, it does bounce around a little bit. But in general, females in this population, uh, prevalence it bounces between 10 and 20 percent, whereas males, it can be anywhere from um, 40 to 60 percent. All right, so to answer that first question, if CWD affects fawn production, well, when we look at pregnancy, um, and so this is uh, animals that are pregnant during capture, so in February, um, we see no significant difference between CWD negative and positive animals. Um, regardless of their disease status, we, uh, most of those animals were pregnant. And also when we look at November recruitment, we saw no significant difference between CWD negative and positive deer. Um, again, low recruitment for this study population. It wasn't surprising because that's what Game and Fish has seen. But um, there was no difference be between these two groups of deer. So uh, a little surprising to us, but um, uh, this was actually corroborated by a study, I believe in Colorado, that also showed no significant difference in fawn recruitment between disease positive and disease negative animals. Where we did see the most significant difference was when we look at survival rates. Um, so f this left side, this left graph um, shows females and this is males. And uh, we did see a significant difference in the survival curves of uh, CWD positive and negative animals. So CWD negative females, um, they had a probability of 0.79 um, annual uh, survival compared to only 0.37 for CWD positive females. Um, a little different story when we look at males. Overall, survival for males in this population was incredibly low. Um, so for CWD negative males, we saw 
uh, a probability of 0.5 compared to 0.19 for CWD positive males. Um, and since these curves overlap, they, it was not statistically different. Um, but again, uh, a, mu a much lower uh, survival probability for CWD positive males. Okay, I'm going to shift gears a little and talk about causes of mortality in our study. Um, so our number one cause of mortality was uh, mountain lion predation followed by clinical CWD. But uh, what I'd like to highlight about this is that when we look at the proportion of animals that were killed by lions or by people, um, we see that uh, the majority of those animals were in fact CWD positive. And this wasn't as surprising because uh, Dr. Mike Miller has published work where they showed that not only are CWD positive animals more vulnerable to predation, but also that mountain lions actually select for CWD positive deer. So, um, and what was interesting too is that uh, these deer were also, also more vulnerable to um, human caused mortality. Okay, so that's, that's the end of the demographic information. So now I'm going to talk about the genetic susceptibility part of this study. Um, and just to remind you all, uh, for mule deer, we're talking about uh, SS or SF and FF genotypes, so not MM or LL, but um, it's within a different codon region, so codon 225. So the S is, um, represents serine, and this is the wild type allele, and it's the most commonly found allele in, in wild populations. Um, and F represents phenylalanine. So um, the majority of deer we find are the 225SS genotype. Um, uh, some of them are the 225SF genotype, and it's rare that we find the FF genotype in the wild. Um, so for the next few slides, uh, I'll be discussing the results of this um, particular project that was published in the Journal of General Virology in 2005. So this was all their work. Um, when they looked at harvested deer in Wyoming and Colorado, so uh, they, of those harvested de deer, they genotyped over 1,400 mule deer. And they found that of those four, um, almost 1,500 mule deer, 7.6% of them had either the SF or FF genotype. So that's 113 of, the, of those deer were SF or FF. And, uh, only one of them actually tested positive for CWD in that sample. Now compare that to the um, uh, almost 1,400 SS deer, and 21% of those tested positive for CWD. So pretty big difference. Um, uh, the SS genotype was overrepresented in their CWD positive samples. So part of that research, they also had an experimental component to the study where they had um, six SS deer and two SF deer, and they fed them infected brain homogenate. And by 19 months, um, several of the SS mule deer showed clinical signs and either died or had to be euthanized. But what's interesting it w is that it wasn't until 36 months after um, inoculation that the SF deer showed clinical signs and were euthanized from the study. So this just highlights the longer incubation period for SF deer compared to SS deer. So based on that information, we decided to also look at the um, genetic frequencies in our populations. And we found that um, in our study population, we uh, have 78% of the SS genotype, um, and then 20% of the SF genotype, and 2% of the FF genotype. And what we found was that one of the SF genotypes tested positive during our study, and both of the SF deer, or I'm sorry, FF deer that we captured um, were test negative to the end of the study. And to go even further, when we look at annual CWD incidence, it's quite different between SS and, and then F, SF and FF deer. Um, so SS deer, their incidence is 0.49 compared to um, SF and FF deer, which is only 0 0.02. So quite different between these groups. And a lot of times um, with these studies, we, uh, 
well, for this study, we lumped SF and FF deer just because there is no evidence to suggest that having, having two of the F allele is better than just one at this point. So we, we lump um, these deer together. Uh, so what was fortunate for us was that with that study that was conducted in the early 2000s, they had also genotyped deer from our particular herd unit. So what's interesting is that when we compare our genetic frequencies in the population that were collected from 2010 to 2014 um, and compare that to uh, the genetic frequencies in the po population from 2001 to 2003, um, there appears to be a shift of fewer SS deer in the population and more deer with the F allele present. Um, and so the next step was to ask, well, is this occurring throughout, um, throughout uh, Wyoming? Do we also see a shift in these genotypes in other populations? So uh, we went out and collected uh, uh, blood samples from herds in western Wyoming, which at the time um, uh, CWD had not been detected in those herds, and we find that they have a more similar composition compared with the earlier um, genotypic frequencies found for our, our, our herd unit. So this potentially suggests that CWD is having some sort of selective pressure on this mule deer population and causing an increase in this F allele. Um, so the last part of the study, uh, putting all our demographic and genetic selection information together, uh, we, we produced a population forecast model, um, or several models actually, and this is very similar to what um, Amy Gerard just presented right before lunch, so same type of modeling. Um, just using it with our demographic information. Uh, so it's an epidemiologic stochastic spreadsheet model design. Uh, we forecasted the population trends out to 100 years. And models included age, sex, CWD status, and genotype-specific vital rates. And we also incorporated those cost-specific mortality probabilities. So all that means is you know, um, males are hunted in this population, so that was incorporated into the model. And then also the differences in their predation risk to mountain lions um, based on their disease status. So we modeled three different scenarios, and I'll go over those. And each model was iterated a thousand times so that we can report our median population size, prion genotype frequencies, and population growth rate at years 25, 50, 75, and 100. So the next few slides are going to look a lot, they're all going to look like this, basically. Um, so I'll walk you through. It's very confusing. So this left. Uh, graft shows population size, and then also we have our pe uh, prion genotypic frequencies, um, and this this is uh, our 100-year uh, period. So the box and whisker plots represent our median population size, and then the the lines represent the genotypic frequencies, which the keys up here. Um, so this is our genotype-specific model. So this is where we're in the model. We're specifying that the SS genotype is more susceptible compared to the SF and FF. And we predict that in the next 100 years that there will be this, still this declining trend in the population with a remnant population about two to 300 deer for, in that area. Um, what's really interesting is that we see a decrease in the SS genotype and an increase in the FF genotype where the majority of the remnant population is in fact the FF genotype at year 100. Um, the graph on the, on the right shows our population growth rate. So uh, a population growth rate of one indicates a stable population, so it's neither decreasing or increasing. And so as you can see that initially, um, our median population growth rate is well below that, that stable line, but as we progress through that 100 year period, um, we start to stabilize at the remnant population of two to 300. Uh, deer. 
So our next model, we looked at a CWD-free scenario, so eliminating CWD as a cause of mortality from this model. And we find that the population is stable to potentially increasing um, with, our genetic, with our genotype frequencies remaining fairly stable as well through the 100-year period. And that is also reflected by the stable uh, population growth rates. And so uh, the last scenario that I'll present on is just our age-specific model. So in this scenario, uh, we're not incorporating genetic susceptibility information. So all genotypes are treated the same, and we just average out their um, probability of infection. And we find that um, the population in, the, in most of those thousand iterations is extirpated within 50 years. And I just... Uh, we decided to run this model because it just shows how different this story can be if you don't have information about the, uh, the genetic susceptibility incorporated into your model. So something as simple as, as um, understanding the differences in genotype susceptibility really makes a difference in how we predict what will happen to, to this population. All right, so going back to our research questions, does CWD suppress vital rates? Um, it do doesn't appear to affect reproduction or recruitment significantly. However, we did see a reduction in survival in females. Does the prion genotype affect CWD susceptibility? And the short answer is yes. And what is the population impact of CWD? So we predict a, a large reduction in this population. However, the remnant population um, of two to 300 deer, they are, they're potentially going to be of a diff different genetic makeup than we, what we see today. Um, and that has its own implications. So I just want to end with this, uh, this map that I stole from the Wyoming Migration Initiative to show that, um, you know, there were three mule deer that tested positive in 2012, very close to the winter range of the red, des red desert, desert deer um, that migrate all the way up to the Hoback. And here we are in Jackson. And then just last year, we had a positive white-tailed deer on the east side of the Wind River Range. And what I failed to put on this map was um, here in um, the Star Valley area, we had a positive mule deer this year. So, you know, the conversation needs to shift from from when CWD gets to the Jackson Hole region because in reality, it's actually already here. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge and thank all of our collaborators and the landowners that uh, participate in this project. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you. Okay, so the question was, can a CWD-infected doe transmit infection to her fawn? Um, so there is evidence that, uh, you know, we know that this disease, disease is transmitted through nose-to-nose -nose contact as well as through the environment, as we've heard this whole morning. Um, so once that fawn um, is born, there's probably a high likelihood of it, of, of it being infected right after birth. Um, there is... Uh, I believe, not in mule deer, but in muntjac deer, um, they showed uh, positive fetal tissues. Um, so there might be some in utero transmission occurring, but I don't know the extent for which that type of transmission really, um, uh, really uh, uh, drives epidemics in populations. Yes. I was curious if you could comment on that, um, the shift in your genotype frequencies. Um, so I wanted to ask about the shift that you saw in the genotype frequencies in your model, which did not have genotype-specific incidents. Right. So, yeah, so you saw, like, a little bit of a shift through time. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the short answer is I don't know at this point. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I actually don't know the answer to that question. It, the change in the genotypic frequencies through that 100-year time period was less than 10%. So it might just be it, Yeah, yeah. I don't know the cause, though. Yeah. So, so I have a sorry. <laughs> I have some similar question. So the, um, the genotype looked like it was kind of redistributing the average in that graph, right? Yeah. So in, in population, the population, um, the SSD are more over, overly represented normally, so it just suggests like a, um, a positive selection for that. Did you look at the sex-specific differences between the um, SS and F alleles to see if there was um, any sex differences? So like you know, males versus having any more females carry? Right. Um, so the question was, if I looked at differences in the SS and FF genotypes um, between males and females. So um, we did capture males that had the F allele. Um, we captured so few males in our study that it's really hard to say uh, if they have similar distributions between the sexes. But um, all I can comment on is that there were... Uh, there were males that had the SF genotype in our, in our study. Uh, the two FF genotypes that we captured were both females, though. Any other questions? Any other questions for me? So. Yes. <laughs> what was your estimated... <laughs> In our demographic model, we used an estimate above 40%. Estimate of incidence for the SS genotype above 40%. Yes. But that's your uh, that's your estimate. That's your average estimate. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.